My name is Monk Rowe for the Phillies Jazz Archive at Hamilton College. I'm very pleased to have Chuck Israels with me today. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Glad to be here. I'm glad somebody's interested in something for a minute. Uh, I, I want to congratulate you on your career thus far and the fact that you're continuing it in Portland. I usually try to think of some way to do an introduction, and I happen to be reading my new Encyclopedia of Jazz circa 1960. And did you know that you're in it? Uh, I believe I did. I don't think I've looked at it for a long yes. time. I think at some point I was concerned that people were paying attention to me, and now I know they're not. <laughs> well, I am. So okay. th it's interesting because uh, I'll just read a, a little bit of it. This is probably an update from his 1955 Leonard Feather original edition, and it says, uh, Chuck Israel's base, born in New York City, 1936, mm -hmm. attended junior high in Cleveland, then to New York City, where he went to the High School of Performing Arts, attended MIT, president of the Symphony Orchestra, self-taught on bass from 1955, studied music at Brandeis. It mentions Herb Pomeroy, and of course it mentions your gig with Billie Holiday and uh, Dakota Staten. Yeah, Dakota Staten's wrong. Okay. I don't, I don't know why that came in there, but it, it seems to be stamped on my biography. Uh, I never met her. I don't know why that's in there. It yes. Just still happens. It's funny. It mentions the LP with Cecil Taylor. And uh, I sort of love reading this stuff because you had your whole career ahead of you. Yes. Um, did you have a philosophy? a form of philosophy about bass playing in your early career? I don't, it's an interesting question. I'm not sure that I, I that I had anything so that I could call myself uh, uh, formed enough to have a philosophy. I think I was very much wanting to be a member of a club that included people that was populated by people, many of whom didn't look like me, and who had a, a cultural milieu, a musical milieu that, that was, that, that attracted me so deeply, that, that felt so much like like me that that I wanted to belong in it and so whatever whatever uh, I was thinking about playing was uh, focused on how I could play to be part of that group of people and be mm -hmm. part of that music so I don't think it was particularly focused on how am I uh, what kind of personal individual contribution I could make so much as how can I how can I be, how can I join this and be accepted and, and be part of this? Was part of it um, trying to find your way in the culture of it, not just, yeah. not just the playing, but the, sure. the, the nightlife and the language and the Absolutely. camaraderie? Absolutely. And I had to do that in my own personal way. White middle class Jewish kid from an educated family uh, hanging out with other s quite smart people, but whose smarts were oriented in slightly different ways from mine and some of whom were drinking and smoking pot and I wasn't ready for any of that. So. Uh, I had to figure out how how to be in it and a part of it without well I just I had to find a way to fit in and interestingly it was a pretty wide open society of people that would that would accept me in there even though I wasn't doing everything that that some of the other people were doing I wasn't alone of course there were other people like me 
I grew up playing with Steve Kuhn and Ronnie Wise, another couple of Jewish kids mm -hmm. that, that were attracted to the music. Yeah. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but you, you uh, in a fairly recent interview, which I thought was done very well um, from a fella out there, you spoke about being in a, in a hotel room with Bill Evans and watching him uh, basically shoot up. And I'm wondering why the drinking and the drugs has been associated with jazz. I'm sure it's overblown, but, but you are saying it was part of the scene. Do you know why? No. Maybe just staying up late at night. I don't. I'm. I'm not sure. I'm going to close the door so I sure. don't hear go practicing the flute so much. Okay. Uh, I don't really know the answer to that. It's it's someone else's uh, area of expertise, and it's and interestingly, it has it has totally evaporated from. You know, as as I went through my jazz career the presence of drugs and drinking diminished, 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 diminished to the point where everybody was uh, health food people and vegetarians yeah. and exercisers and <laughs> a lot smarter, I think. Yes, and I'm very happy to hear that. Um, do you think of yourself, like, like many jazz musicians, you've worn many hats. Perhaps you were a player first, then you became a composer. In fact, I, you can correct me if this is not right, but on your that first recording with, you did with John Coltrane, it looks like you had a tune on the record. Yes, I mean, it, 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 boy, that was, that was just something that just happened. I had this little exercise. I was, I was doing a counterpoint exercise and uh, for, at the time for my uh, for, for my uh, theory class at Brandeis and uh, I and I thought okay I'm going to take these two little figures and juxtapose them in it and and they're sort of harmonically ambiguous enough that they can go against each other and against uh, changing harmony they're kind of non-committal melodically in that sense uh, uh, and I put them one here and one here and one here and one here. I just tried to figure out a way that they would, that these two things would fit together and make a little tune. And it was just sitting on my music stand. And uh, I don't remember whether it was John Coltrane or Kenny Dorham or one of the other, one of the wind players said, oh, look to but, oh let's play this. That's, that's how that happened. Oh, and, that is wonderful. Yeah, it is. It was wonderful. When you were working on it, did you even conceive it as a jazz tune? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. And then you did a quick arrangement on the spot. Yeah, it just. I mean, it was a. It was set to a blues, so there, there was nothing to do but play the tune and play, and play blues. Mm -hmm. play. So it, that it was it was easy enough to do. I, I thought it was awfully friendly of those guys to you know, older than me to, to, to consider the possibility that this might be something worth doing. When we read in your bios that you performed early on with uh, Billie Holiday and John Coltrane and Cecil Taylor, I think it's hard for us to go back to that time and imagine what were those musicians what was their reputation at the time? Were your, were your knees shaking because, oh, I'm playing with John Coltrane? Uh, not so much John, because at that point, John was one of the respected tenor players of the day, not the icon that he later became. Uh, I certainly liked his playing in some ways i want to say that i liked his earlier playing better than some of his later music uh, for a number of reasons uh, that i 
have explored a lot in the, in the book that I'm writing how 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 the music changed and what different things influenced it. Uh, Billie Holiday, uh, I certainly knew how revered she was, and that was. I, was that a year earlier? I can't remember if it was in the same year or what time. But I get my seek, my chronological sequence is a little out of joint from time to time. I was pretty young. I was 22 when I played with Billy. And uh, when people ask me about it, I, uh, I I tell the same story. And that is that I don't remember that much about what she sang or how she, how she was because I was so necessarily preoccupied with doing the job well. I related to that immediately because um, I was lucky enough to play behind Aretha Franklin once in, in the saxophone section and I found that within the first five minutes that I had to stop paying attention to her because I wasn't covering my part. Yeah. And, exactly. You know, it was a bit of a drag like I have to ignore Aretha Franklin. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, it was like that with Billy too, and and uh, I, I I must have done well enough because she was certainly complimentary afterwards and comfortable with 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 me and with Jimmy Zatano, the drummer that I had recommended that they bring from Boston to play with her. He was a fine, fine drummer. And we just spent a few minutes in the afternoon with uh, Mal Waldron the pianist and went over a few things and then bang it was on stage for the concert and and as just as you described if you don't have a lot of room in your mind to pay attention to your surroundings when you're new to the new to the part that you're playing i want to read something that came from uh, your blog and it, it has to do with that that period of time i believe I won't read the whole thing, but I found it quite interesting. So the musicians who grew up playing jazz in the U.S. in the 1940s and 50s had every reason to believe that they were pursuing their artistic activities in an atmosphere of common understanding with the members of the audience. Most musicians felt they were following or perhaps creating together a common aesthetic. Why back then do you think the audience and the musicians were closer than I assume you think they are today? It's, a, it's an essential question. And the answer to it is that I grew up in a most unusual period of time. One that I perceived from the inside as having been completely normal and that was in fact historically abnormal. And that was a period in which, starting roughly in the late 19th century and going through to the little past the middle of the 20th century, a period when popular music was created by and consumed by educated people. And that's a most unusual historical phenomenon. Well, why has the increase, phenomenal increase in jazz education since the you know early seventies? Are you? Can I extrapolate and say that you don't think it has improved the audience? For the music, uh, in, in small ways, yes, but mostly not, and it's much bigger than the jazz educational, uh, the jazz education industry. Uh, and I, I, I use that word slightly pejoratively, but not entirely. It, it just, it just as a way to talk about. Um, the only other period that I know of in which popular art seemed also to be at this kind of high level is uh, the period of Elizabethan theater. I, you know, I'm talking about the, the period starting with Scott, Scott Joplin and uh, Jelly Roll Morton and uh, John Philip Sousa 
That's the, that's the late 19th century. And carrying through Louis Armstrong and the swing era and the bebop era. And all during that time, jazz and popular music were connected. They were using the same material. There was a continuity of musical, uh, of musical material and thought that reached back, as a matter of fact, it reached back hundreds of years, back to Bach and beyond. And there was this musical continuity. You could see this developing over this and this being added to this and, and nothing was really discarded. Nothing, nothing was thrown away. In the mid 1960s, when the baby boom generation reached adolescence, that rich cultural era was decimated by this enormous population of teenagers who had money, not on purpose. It just was a, it just was a sociocultural event. So all these undeveloped people, and as we all were at that, at, at 13, 14, and 15, you and I and everyone else, all these undeveloped people with money in their pockets became the target of the market machinery. And their music, their adolescent music and adolescent musical ideas, undeveloped musical ideas, took over and marginalized everything else. And that is, and now we're in that system and have been there since roughly the mid 60s. I mean, I'm, you know, it's hard to put a date on it, but or the late 60s. And now I think we're in a much more normal situation in which good cultural things are subsidized by uh, institutions and uh, of educated and basically wealthy people. And that in general, the popular music of, of the masses, the masses of all of these people whom I have every reason to love, except, except about that, uh, uh, that their music is is now all disposable stuff and won't be has no durability at all. Won't be. You will never remember a Beyonce song or a Prince song or uh, those are those are not going to become cultural icons of America. In spite of the in, no matter how many articles are written about them in the Atlantic or the New York or this, they'll be gone. I don't disagree with you, but we probably could find people who do. Oh, we can find plenty of people who do. Yes. Absolutely. But they're wrong. Can I conclude then that um, listening to jazz, especially not, not jazz vocalists, but instrumental jazz, requires something more from the listener than, the, than Beyonce or... Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And, what, and what is that that it requires? It requires uh, a, a history of understanding of language, of the musical language, and what the musical language means in its abstract way. Okay, means in its abstract way. Can you extrapolate on that a little bit? Well. I don't know what what meaning there is in music in uh, how to put into words what music means. I do understand that it that music makes me understand my humanity, my human existence, the things I feel and things I think about as, as this kind of human animal. And when I, when I hear uh, the music of another human animal like me, I hear into the sensibility and experience of that person and I either feel 
connected and things in common with that or or not. What that meaning is in words, I can. It, it, it's it's a if if I could tell you what it meant in words, I wouldn't have to sing. You know, it, 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 not that I can sing, but uh, I wouldn't need I wouldn't need to play bass or play with Bill Evans or Stan Getz. Or, uh, I wouldn't need that if if poetry did it to me. I for see. some people, poetry does that for them. Uh, there is some kind of balance of qualities of this soundscape that we make in music that 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 is a kind of abstract poetry for me. And when I hear this abstract musical poetry of another person, or I play with another person and we create that stuff together, I am generally connected and associated with that person's sensibility and life in a way that kinds of holds away the loneliness of death. Well, it's you, a big, well, you know, kind of a big thing to say about it, but I don't know why else we do it. You, you wrote play, sing, as if you could not speak. Yes. And I believe that's what you're talking about. And I, I really like what you just said because I struggle with this question of what does music mean? Unless it's descriptive or programmatic and it's trying to describe something specifically, what does music mean? And I think it means enough if you listen to a Mozart passage and it touches you somehow, like he knew how to use the elements of music and combine them in a way that made me respond. Uh, just like earlier this morning, I was listening to your um, Concerto Pellegroso, mm -hmm. and I, I was gonna get to this a little later, but we could go there now because I was really struck by the, the way that you avoided the common, okay, the time's in the bass and the drums, and I'm going to lay everything over that, and the bass and the drums are keep going all the time. Instead, you had um, piano interludes, you had complex unison passages, you had ensemble work where it sounded to me like the bass was laying out, and then you brought everybody together, and it the texture changed frequently and kept my attention. Was that your intention? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Long question, short uh, answer. <laughs> of course. Uh, yeah, well, I, I thought the bass and drums playing time feels so good, uh, but it feels better if it comes as the lanyep at the end, you know? Uh, 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 if you... If, and uh, when I listen to that, I think maybe I held it back a little too long. I, I'm not sure, you know, in terms of the, the proportions and balance of that. But, but boy, when it comes in, you think, yeah. oh, yeah. And, and yeah, that, was the, that was the effect I was looking for. And you can't get that effect if you start with that. You have to build some tension. Uh, and uh, how much of the, this was an intellectual idea and how much of it was just... You know, I, I'm not, I'm not sure what my thought process is all the time. Well, you know, I, but yes, certainly, I that was a conscious effort. On my okay, part. those ideas. Um, when you conceive of a composition, perhaps it's at the piano, or perhaps it's taking a walk. Anything in between those two. But the arrangement of it, the arrangement of the initial idea, do you think that's where those textures and so forth come come from? Yes. Or arrive? Yes, yeah. They're interesting to me. I, I'm, I'm particularly interested in what, in what, um, what, a, what an ensemble of instruments does together as a group. I'm, 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 I'm 
I, I'm certainly affected by soloists and what they can do, uh, but I tend to write things that are focused on group interaction. Uh, things that soloists can do uh, often are best left to them. Uh, I mean, not entirely. There are plenty of people who write wonderful solo music. And I, I'm not saying that I never write that, but I'm more interested in, oh, I can write this for this person to do, and, or this instrument, or you know, generally I think of them as having certain kind of personalities uh, in an abstract way. But okay, this personality does this, and this personality responds in this way, and then the group, uh, it's, it's the interaction is what's what's interesting to me, most interesting. Have you ever had a circumstance where a, a soloist was playing in a fashion that you didn't feel was contributing to the overall feeling of the piece? And, Occasionally. And, and, and what do you do about that? Uh, you shut up and live with it, usually. Hmm. Uh, 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 it depends on the circumstance. There are circumstances in which you can stop and fix it. Uh, most people don't do that intentionally, uh, but it has happened. Um, it happened at a concert with the National Jazz Ensemble, I think in Buffalo. I, I think it was a concert that and Gunther Schuller was there. And, and after the concert, I talked to him about it and we both had the same response. And it was uh, a couple of, of alto saxophone players got into a, a a saxophone battle that uh, might have been the, the, the idea of a kind of a back and forth exchange between soloists is not a bad thing. But they lost sight of the, they lost, lost connection with the piece uh, and started playing a bunch of stuff that they practiced that sort of fit harmonically, but it did, to me, it was, oh, God, I wish they'd shut up and stop so we could finish the piece. Um, and I remember uh, someone telling me an, uh, an apocryphal or maybe real Ellington quote in which uh, Jimmy Hamilton went to Ellington and said, hey, it's this clarinet solo here, but it has no, no chord changes and stuff. And, and Ellington's response was, yeah, that's because I want you to play my piece, not that stuff that you practice. Wow. So, and there's a balance of that too, because I, when I leave open solo space, I certainly want a contribution from the personality of the, of, of, the, of the musician who is in that position. They can make enormous contributions that I don't even think of, that, that they can bring stuff to the music that that enlivens it and gives it an immediacy that uh, that my written part doesn't doesn't necessarily contain. It contains the opportunity for that because when the Guarneri Quartet sits down and plays a late Beethoven quartet, they do it in such a way that you believe they're making it up. And if they don't, they're not giving a good performance. I'm reminded of a quote. Um, Dave Ravello, who's at Eastman School of Music, attributed to Bob Brookmeyer, and he said, when you write a big band arrangement, try to put off as long as you can the solo. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, it depends. Uh, yeah, I, I, can, I can see. Hey. It, it's a challenge, you know, because we, we say, okay, we have an intro, then we do the head, whatever it is, and we do the bridge, and, you know, if you're A, A, B, A, and then you get to that spot now, I have a shout chorus in mind, but I can't do it yet. <laughs> so. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I also. Yeah, I I understand his, his position about that. As uh, I find, I find Bobby Brookmeyer a, a kind of a uh, difficult uh, person because he is full of dichotomies. Mm. Uh, uh, he he has done extraordinarily beautiful work and some obtuse stuff that I 
just don't understand at all. Okay. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know what you know what the development of his aesthetics, you know, why what he went through, but uh, but, I, but nevertheless, I think he he's been a thoughtful person about these things and then that and there's some there's some something in that that's what he's saying there is a don't don't take the easy way out and just give it to the souls now develop your peace for further and um i think that's as a composer that's that's a valid valid perception and a valid uh, goal when you listen to your rhythm section, which you're usually a part of. Um, can you tell when things are not swinging? Sure. And what is yeah. what what is that about? Usually about a misalignment or um, A misalignment of accents, or uh, in, an imbalance of one kind or another. Uh, I often find uh, you, you talked about jazz education earlier, and I there are a lot of people in the field of jazz education who are in a position, who are forced into a position of teaching about teaching things about which they are insufficiently informed. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not entirely their fault. I don't let them completely off the hook, but, but someone who says to the drummer, uh, play strong on two and four, uh, doesn't understand that the reason we accent two and four is simply to counterbalance the fact that all the harmonic information and a certain emphasis is happening on the first and third beats of most four four pieces. And you don't want to overbalance, you don't want to do a counterbalance that 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 tips the feeling of the music too far in the opposite direction. It is just as as uh, counterproductive and uh, flat footed and uh, to to have strong two and overly strong two and four as it is, is to have an um, uh, you know a, a, a Oktoberfest umpa band or a polka band and not not that there, not that there's anything wrong with that music when it's well played but uh, uh, they don't understand that and they don't have the perspective of having played with with uh, drummers and rhythm sections that have a fluidity of uh, of accent and rhythmic texture that keeps the sense of the music moving forward and 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 has a balance of that 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 is uh, agile and um uh that senses gravity and 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 allows you to feel um perhaps graceful and agile and light-footed uh, against against the pull of gravity all of this, I mean, it's just an abstract thought about, again, words about something that comes into your ears and does tickle something in your brain, but it makes you understand something about your human condition. 170 pounds of me going out for a walk and going up the hill and down the hill or running, and I don't run very much anymore, but hardly any, uh, or, or doing my silly little dance, and how that feels, how my body feels against the pull of the earth. You're a poet also. <laughs> I, I enjoyed your, um, that description. And it, it, one more quote I read from you. I think you were addressing music that bothered you. And you said music which assaults the mind and restricts it with a numbing drone commands the brain not to think and holds thought hostage while it rapes the ear. Yeah, well, boy, I, that, that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs>
that's what I used to I used to think that every in the, you remember in the seventies when George Winston's music was you yes, the this? new age craze. I'd go into a restaurant and they would have this Chinese water torture drip of sound of George Winston playing arpeggio triads one after the other after the other after the other. It would drive me right up to the wall. Isn't it interesting to be sitting with in a restaurant like that and thinking, am I the only one in here who's who's yes. driven to distraction by this music? Yeah. I also have had the experience of being at a party where uh, where I I was specifically invited graciously as a new faculty member by another faculty member uh, wanting to introduce me to his friends and make me feel welcome. And I'm at this party in this nice guy's house. Uh, and he's got a, he's playing a monk record. And we're standing around having a conversation and I, I go up to this, to Milt and say, gee, Milt, please turn that off. I can't, I can't talk to people. I, I have to listen to that. It's not background to me. Interesting. And there was a time where you didn't like Thelonious Monk. Isn't that true? That's right. That's right. Absolutely. I was uh, terribly, uh, I rejected that music uh, out of hand and incorrectly and stupidly or ignorantly. Uh, and that is, uh, I lost a lot of time appreciating that and being around him when I could have I, I could have been paying attention and taking a lot more in and getting a lot more value out of my, out of being in the, being, playing opposite his band. I played with Bobby Timmons Trio opposite Monk's Quartet at the Five Spot uh, in New York for weeks and weeks. Did you listen to his music in that particular situation with the idea that what would I do if I was his bass player? No, I didn't get that far. Okay. Uh, I, I, I was, some people have, when I've talked to them about this, have excused me, probably realistically, by saying, of course, you were focused on a particular thing. Mm -hmm. You were, you were trying to understand and become conversant in the language of Bill Evans, Tommy Flanagan, uh, Hank Jones, uh, Sonny Clark, for the piano players, for example. Yeah. Uh, and the piano playing language of Monk was so at least superficially diametr diametrically opposed to that that you couldn't take it in you couldn't see that was that was banging you didn't want banging you wanted well okay it is it is banging he does play the, he does bang the piano uh, the fact is he banged the piano in a most incredibly artistic uh, uh, and and effective and uh, creative and personal way that I now appreciate with uh, almost worshipful uh, understanding. I didn't at the time, but okay. Fortunately, it happened before I died. All right. I wanted to ask you about a um, just a little bit about your time with Bill Evans and. I saw you say that when you got that gig, which of course was under unfortunate circumstances, but nonetheless, you felt you were going to get it. Yes. Um, this was written about Scott LaFaro well after the fact in the new uh, Grove Dictionary. He said, Scott set the standard for new generations of jazz bass players 
who varied their accompaniment by mixing traditional timekeeping with far-ranging counter melodies in free rhythm. Now, I don't know if at that time people would have written that or if it's in retrospect, but you didn't feel any pressure to, like, try to recreate what he was doing? No. There was, as, as often happens in the world, it's rarely one person who comes up with whatever it is that the new thing is. It does happen occasionally. I just heard an interesting podcast about uh, a Hungarian woman scientist who uh, was the instigator of the mRNA uh, uh, technology that, the biological technology that created the uh, the vaccines that we're now using against COVID. And it seems to have been pretty much this one person's idea, but that's not normal. It's usually a bunch of people scattered about or working together or different people in different places at the same time. Scotty wasn't alone. He was a virtuoso and he was an extraordinarily hardworking and demonically driven and terrifically gifted and and very attractive person musically and physically and I mean he was a charismatic guy um, but he wasn't the only one playing that way uh, he developed it I think better than and more quickly and more in a more advanced way than most of the rest of us but in his kind of folk music-like way, Charlie Hayden was doing it, and there was a guy named Albert Stinson who died young, uh, who was also doing that, and Steve Swallow was kind of thinking like that, and I was playing music like that. Not, not because we thought we were doing anything new. It was just the way we heard the music. I heard things besides quarter notes. I listened to Oscar Pettiford and John Neves and thought, hmm, okay, I want to do that. And in my, in my desire to do that, out came these other things that weren't exactly that, because I was able to, if I'd been able to play as well as Oscar Pettiford, if I'd been able to imitate that, I probably would have done it. But in the short wall came out some personality or some different personality. Great point. Uh, at that time, much of this material that happened at the time, that's not the right word, I'm struggling here, but the idea of who's the timekeeper? Who's everybody. E everybody, okay. Everybody. And, and has it changed since the 50s and 60s to now, uh, to current trios and quartets that are currently creating music now. Do you believe it has changed? Uh, pr in principle, I don't think so. Okay. In, in, in practice, it depends on who's playing. Uh, the best principle is nobody is uh, every tub sits on its own bottom. That's, you, you know that every tub, yeah. Yeah. that's what that expression, you know, every Everybody's responsible for his, for his or her own timekeeping properties. Uh, you don't want to be leaning heavily. Every once in a while, you know, you you get pushed off your 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 foundation for a moment, and you gotta refer to somebody else for for a split second, but it should only be that. I'm trying to recall if uh, during the time you were with Bill Evans, if there were a change in drummers. Yes. Three. And how did, how did, wow, how did that, uh, did it affect your, the way you approach the music? I don't think so. Uh, the first drummer was Paul Motium, who's, did a good job. I wasn't 
completely enamored of his playing, but uh, I liked it. You know, I, I, I didn't find it, I didn't find it very, uh, how can I put it? I didn't find it very beautiful. With just the way he hit the drums, his, his sound, uh, he, he was kind of a vertical drummer. Uh, and, but it, it was okay and I was glad to be in the band and I, I, I don't think I was thinking critically about it. I, I, I just don't remember being, I don't remember thinking very much about it at all. It, was, it, it certainly didn't stop us from playing and the music was happening and it was fine. Then Paul left, I think, partly because he found my playing a little more conventional than he, I think, I, I don't really know. I would have to have asked him and I didn't. So, but I know he said at one point that he didn't love my playing that much. Okay. Uh, and then I brought Larry Bunker into the band and Larry Bunker, is one of a number of drummers that I've worked with who were absolutely superb musicians, just superb. And not only intuitive, but also educated. He was in many ways better musician than I. It's at the door, Marco will have to get it. Um, and that was a joy. For me. I, I loved playing with Larry. Uh, it was on every level. It was perfect in terms of uh, dynamics and sound quality and texture and volume and interaction and swing and all the things you would want. It was I, there, this, I can't say enough about it. But good. It was really great. Then Larry left and uh, he for personal reasons, I mean, he had to get back to California. His uh, father-in-law had died and uh, he had to get back to his wife. And, um, and we were looking for somebody and Bill auditioned a drummer I thought was named Joe Chambers. And I thought this, this guy's gonna be good. But Bill thought he was not yet developed enough. I, I didn't understand exactly what he meant by that. And I said, well, why don't you try my, the guy I grew up playing with, Arnie Wise. And Arnie, Arnie's approach to playing was, the sound quality was very much like Larry's. A very pretty drum sound. You, can sit, you could sit next to either of them, right next to the drum set, and have the band on the other side, and you could hear through the drum set, you could hear all the music on the other side. Uh, Arnie had that quality, and so did Larry. So those are, that's, and, and Arnie made less of a, he was more like glue, gluing the bass and piano parts together. He wasn't much of an instigator of things. I see. But he would take the, the duet and meld that beautifully. You are a poet. So I'm, gonna I'm, working, I'm working on a book, so I, uh, okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm verbally oriented at the moment. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and, and yet it, it never really, it doesn't substitute for hearing the music. Yeah, it's true. It's, it's, it's true, absolutely. Music is something that uh, is very hard to pin down, but people try. In fact, I found this rather odd quote, Humphrey Littleton, and wrote it in 1965. He did a show called Jazz 625. Well, we're on it. There's all those. The, the, right. The right. Yeah. And he said, uh, Chuck Israel is a superb technician who handles the double bass as easily as if it were a guitar. He's one of the reasons why musicians have come away reeling from performances by that Bill Evans trio in a mood poised between elation and utter despair. Well, he gives me too much credit for virtuosity. 
uh, I, I, well, too much. I, I, you know, it's how he saw it. It's, it was his perception of it, and maybe the perception of, of of some other people. With, from my perspective, knowing my limitations in terms of virtuosity and technical prowess. Um, I think I used my abilities efficiently and perhaps, and I was a lot faster than I am now too. I mean, that, that's just, that that's true. Uh, I was fast enough for the music and faster than, and, but mostly it was melodic, a, 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 a melodic perspective about what you could do on the bass. I tried to play tunes, but I wasn't the only one doing that. You know, Oscar Pettiford did the same thing. And Red Mitchell was the virtuoso who made all of us look a little silly. He was really superb. He, he, he was like Lester Young or Charlie Parker on the bass. It was, it was just gorgeous, incredible, melodic invention and freedom. I want to go back to your, uh, your composing and arranging for a bit. And can you describe where inspiration comes from how does it how does it something new get started other people's music can you give uh, an okay. example well i wrote a piece called uh, skipping tune it's my version of bill evans's piece called walking up it has it's built up the same material oh he made a piece out of these kinds of materials exclusively these kinds of materials. Major seventh chords, uh, minor seventh chords, and no dominance. But he did it in such a way that the piece feels as if it has progress and as if the, as if the chords have, have harmonic intention, as if they are moving forward. They're not static. It's not just this chord for a while and now arbitrarily shift to this one. It has it has real. I think we've lost each other. It got lost for a minute. Never mind. Lost. <laughs> but yes, you were describing. Um, in fact, I, I heard that tune. You're you're skipping tune, and I, I love the forward motion in it. And it was it was happy. Yes, it, was, it, it is happy. It yeah. doesn't have any dominant chords in it. It's interesting. Yeah. You can write a piece that feels as if it moves forward and doesn't have any wow. well, a few tritones hidden in it, but it's not really it, it, they don't they don't do the same thing that a that a dominant chord does. And yeah, I would I just I like the feeling of Bill's piece walking up and I thought, oh I, I like the feeling of that. Let me do my own version of that. So my pieces are they they come from other musical ideas that I've heard, and that's just me. I don't care if you want to write a piece about a, uh, about the, if you're Charles Ives and you want to write the Housatonic at Stockbridge, uh, I know Stockbridge and the Housatonic River very well, and I understand it's very nice, but I can't paint a picture of that in, in, in music. Uh, I can take a photograph and that's, my music is, and I, I, don't, I don't maintain that that is how everyone should do it, it's, that's just, how my mind works. Mm -hmm. Have you ever written something and then only to find out that someone already wrote it? What what you wrote was so close to something else that you realized that you were sort of channeling something else? Not really. Uh, I don't think so. That's good because it can be a drag. Yeah. Uh, I've written something, and I had to, an interesting experience I've had is in the 1970s, I wrote a piece that was somewhat influenced by uh, Maiden Voyage and some, and the, the straight eighth note music of the time, which didn't interest me at all. But I, I, 
it didn't feel like me somehow. But I had this thought about writing a piece that had that in it. It's actually mostly that. But it has a relief of a double time four four section short, but just it's 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 it, to me it's the piece of saving grace. It's the one thing that keeps it from being this being a piece and being a piece that I don't like. I still don't like it in a way. Uh, but I brought it out. I wrote it in the 1970s, and I was working with um, uh, some very fine musicians here and going to make a made a recording of this in the last few weeks. They said, oh, we like this piece, let's play it. And I said, you know, that piece feels to me like a polyester leisure suit. <laughs> Some uh, people like them. <laughs> yes, well, the thing is, these guys are in their 40s and 50s and of another generation. And yes. to them, this is music that they, they relate to. They liked the piece very much and they actually performed it very well. And we've recorded it. I have a terrible fear that it's going to be my hit. And you'll have to play it every night. Yeah. <laughs> Are you happy with the, this is, this is an odd question, but your music has gone places that probably you and I wish it hadn't. Would you have been happier if your career had started when Red Mitchell's did, or? Well, it did pretty much. Okay, well then, then my timing's off. But were there eras of music that you wish you had participated in earlier on? I never thought of that. I haven't thought about that. Huh. <laughs> I, I, it doesn't it, my mother used to say what if there were no hypothetical questions uh -huh. think about that <laughs> oh <laughs> let me get back to you on that okay <laughs> uh, I, it, just, it hasn't occurred to me okay I, I, I feel tremendously lucky to have had to have been born and and to have had my artistic life happen when it happened had it happened a little bit earlier maybe that had been that would have been good uh, but then i wouldn't be alive now talking to you so <laughs> okay so i'm happy <laughs> Okay, a couple of things uh, to wrap up with. You know, usually when uh, when I get ready for an interview or most interviewers, they do their homework and they might pick four or five topics that they definitely want to get to in the time they have. But they those are not always the topics that the interviewees might pick. So, I'm wondering if there's something that you would like to talk about that I haven't asked or that no one else has ever asked. Well, not that no one else has ever asked, but something I think about all, all the time is the discontinuity of, uh, uh, of musical language that happened roughly in the, in, in the late 60s. And it happened not only in jazz, it happened in popular music, it happened in theater music. You know, if you, if the difference between Gershwin, Harold Arlen, uh, Frank Lesser, Cole Porter, and Andrew Lloyd Webber, there's a chasm, there's an absolute chasm. All the rest is continuous music from pre-Bach through Baroque, classical, romantic, 20th century music. And here, are, and, and the threads go back through that. And all of a sudden, all of these threads are broken. That doesn't make any sense to me. I don't relate to 
to that. I don't relate to Hamilton as music. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, it's, it's discontinuous. Could it have anything to do with technology? Sure. Like everything Probably. keeps getting better and better. Uh, uh, technology in the theater, lights and sets and all that. And maybe somehow the music was conceived as we don't need it to be as, um, as deep as it used to be. I don't know. That's a good thought. I, I, that, that's certainly possible. Uh, certainly that is, is a fact of uh, that things have skewed that way. Uh, whether it's a result or an intention, I, you know, I, I'm not in a position to, to, to judge that. But um, I, I'm more inclined to think that it's a result of the same problem that I think pop music has, and that is that, that we reverted to cheap popular music sometime in you know, in kind of in the middle of my lifetime, you know, in my, in my 30s and 40s, the, the things that had built uh, on which our popular music was built, going back to Stephen Foster and, 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 and uh, the music my grandmother sang to me, what I heard on the radio when I was a child. Uh, uh, you know, you heard Cole Porter, you heard Gershwin, you heard Fats Waller, you heard Duke, Duke Ellington, you heard... Uh, also some cheap stuff, but but not entirely. And then at a certain point, all of that went away and you no longer heard Rosemary Clooney sing or Big Crosby sing or Frank Sinatra sing, that that was gone. And for a while, it there was this uh, Motown music that wasn't so bad. It had a lot of good things in it and then, and then pretty much that dissipated too and you have nothing but well, what to me is empty, empty headed, empty soulless stuff that, that doesn't relate to my experience as a, as a human being doesn't, I hear those people and I, I don't feel close to them. I don't feel that they are, that, that they are, I understand their anger and their displeasure. I mean, I, but I, I don't feel connected. I'll close with, um, I, I've so much enjoyed this conversation uh, and the way you describe things. I forget if I read this or if I heard it in that aforementioned interview. You said it's an instinct for humans to be somewhat prejudiced, that it's part of their human nature to question or feel somewhat threatened by people who are different. I think so. Do you think it's getting worse? I don't know. It, it certainly seems to be threatening socio-politically at the moment. There's, but at the same time that there are a lot of people who I think are succumbing to their prejudices, I think we all have them. I, that, that, that was kind of my point is I think we all have them. And the question is not whether or not you have them, but whether or not you succumb to them. Uh, as many people as there are that are succumbing to them, there's also kind of a big group of people who say, no, we don't do that. It's, it's rather polarized. I mean, we, we're experiencing a moment of the exposure of the polarization. It's too big a subject for me to feel as if I have any control of it or, or any real historical perspective on it. But it is, it's a little scary. And certainly, 
when you see the mach machinery of political power and political power hunger, when you see that machinery grinding and moving in ways gr and grinding towards things that are that historically remind you of of Nazism mm -hmm. and authoritarianism and all of those things, and and you see a lot more of that in a in a general way, then it's it's a little frightening. Uh, no question. Okay. Uh, I grew up as a teenager in the McCarthy era. So a lot of my friends were, uh, and friends of our family, most not my friends, but my parents were, were terribly threatened by that. Paul Robeson, uh, Lester Cole, who was one of the Hollywood 10, Dalton Trumbo, people like that, uh, Zero Mostel. Uh, yeah, it didn't, uh, even though there was Joe McCarthy in the House on American Activities Committee, wasn't, it wasn't the whole government. We've lived through four years of the whole government being governed by corrupt hunger for power. And I don't, I haven't lived through, I'm 84, in the 80 years, 80 other years as negative as some things have been it's never it was never like that is that something that feeling is that something you would write music about would no. you okay i i think i knew the answer to that from what you have said earlier um so really thank you for your time i, I have one last quick question when do titles arrive for you when you compose? Sometimes before the piece, sometimes there's a list of them and I just stick one on. Yeah. Uh, because they mostly, it's pretty hard to describe what is this. It could be composition number one, composition number three, composition number 47. Uh, So the answer is they, they come kind of arbitrarily. Okay. I've got to, got to give it a name. Right. It needs a name. Yeah. <laughs> who, who is the, uh, the sax player who would have diagrams and, and Anthony Braxton. Oh. Sometimes he would have like little drawings and stuff. That was the title. Uh -huh. Oh, I can understand that. Yes. Okay. Well, I appreciate your, your time today. And it was fascinating conversation. I wish you best of luck you're, that your non-net continues and that you uh, continue composing and so forth. Thanks, Mark. Well, I, I appreciate it. I miss the East. I miss where you are. All of that, that's my territory. It feels strange to be out here. And mm -hmm. I mean, I've been out here half my life, almost, no, not quite, almost, yeah, almost half my life. And that feels like, it's okay. It's beautiful. The weather's better. Uh, we're in a blue state, you know, in a blue yeah. city, basically. So think, things are, you know, it's not terrible. Okay. But I miss New England. I miss New York. I miss uh, upstate New York and, and, and Vermont. And, uh, and I just, that's, that's home to me. And it's kind of, so enjoy the things I'm missing. Okay. Maybe there's a song title in there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you very much okay, for I, your I, interest and attention. And, uh, I, right. what, is this recorded video as well or, or just uh yes this is going to be on video and um we have a youtube channel i see yes so i'll pause Hello. our recording and then we'll say goodbye okay thank you very much